Plus, what do you have to do when a queen decides she's going to pop in to see you, and not just any old queen, Victoria? Like a pair of obsessed Victoria groupies, we're pursuing her around the country to the posh pads she visited. We'll be delving into first-hand accounts to reveal what happened behind closed doors. She was only 13 when she arrived here at Shugborough Hall in Staffordshire. As someone who spent a lifetime getting excited by antiques, I'll be upstairs finding out how clever tricks might have fooled the future monarch. Not so much smoke and mirrors, more like ceiling and pillars. And as a chef who loves all sorts of food, I'll be downstairs where I'll be rediscovering a 19th century recipe that was served to Victoria. Do you use one of these? No, I want one. Can yeah. I take that home with me? No way. <laughs> Took me two years to find one. <laughs> and seeing if Tim is game enough to try it. I say they did live well, you know. We're continuing our journey in the footsteps of the young Victoria as she, as a slip of a girl, had a tour of the nation with her mother, the Duchess of Kent, so that the people could see their future monarch. The young Princess Victoria had travelled from the much grander and much larger Chatsworth House further north following a successful visit. Her hosts at Shugborough were Lord and Lady Litchfield, a wealthy and well-connected family. This was a much more modest home than many that Victoria had visited, but I'm still keen as mustard to take a bird's eye upstairs. Which is exactly what I'm going to do downstairs. The local paper records that on her arrival at the hall, a band played God Save the King and a royal salute of guns was fired. According to her recently begun diary, Victoria and the royal party arrived in the late afternoon and she records that about half past five, we arrived at Shugborough, the place of Lord Litchfield. Lord and Lady Litchfield helped the Duchess of Kent and the Princess from their carriage. The Derby Mercury describing the 13-year-old Victoria, seen here with her mother, as an interesting and intelligent-looking child. By the time of Victoria's visit, Shugborough had reached its peak as a modern estate and a fashionable country seat. The family had worked hard in the previous 100 years at transforming what was once a plainer, medium-sized house into something that would enhance their name and general standing. And the architectural trickery they used starts at the entrance, which looks very grand, as long as you don't knock up against it. Because there is something sham about this facade. If you tap the column, it's not solid stone. It's actually made of wood. And the walls of the house itself were covered in slate to make them look like solid blocks of stone. It was no doubt good enough to fool a 13-year-old. And inside, the clever tricks to impress continued. The first Earl's father and his architect did their utmost to confuse the eye, to cover up the fact that this house was once a bog-standard country house that had simply become a bit grander. And the way they did that was by installing this oval ceiling and all these pillars. So, to deceive the eye, then, not so much smoke and mirrors, more like ceiling and pillars. Today, Shugborough is still run as a working and historic estate, with the staff still doing all the jobs that would have been done when Victoria was here. And at that time, like any respectable country pile, it had an army of servants. In fact, four years before the visit in 1832, it was recorded that 109 full-time salaried staff were working on the estate. This is where the unmarried staff would have slept, in the stable yard. The men would go that side, and the women would sleep that side. So there was no horsing around here, thank you very much. 
the staff wore different coloured uniforms because it made it easier to spot if they were in their rightful place. Red was worn by the kitchen maids, blue by the laundry maids, green by the still room staff and purple by the housemaids. The housekeeper and the cooks had no official uniform. This itself was a form of status. Men at Shugborough also had colour coding to their uniforms, but unlike the women, they had expensive specialist uniforms from livery makers in London. And the staff would have dined here. The servants' hall was the hub of downstairs life. <laughs> with the young princess upstairs, this place would have been a buzz with tension and gossip. With a royal visit to cater for, the household stocked up for lavish dining. And Ivan Day, our food historian, has got his hands on a wonderful document, a list of the food and drink consumed during Victoria's three-day visit. 76 pheasants, 38 partridges, 10 hares, 54 fowls. In fact, it says at the bottom here, 195 head of game and poultry. So I thought we'd do something with pheasants. Fantastic. Today's royal delicacy is a dish invented by a famous French chef called Antonin Carême, who dominated this period. It's called fillets of pheasant à la chartreuse. And like so much Victorian cooking, it's very complex and time-consuming. Chartreuse was a very elaborate vegetable dish where you used little discs or squares of cut-out vegetables. Yes. So you've got wonderful colours. And you arrange them like a mosaic. It's beautiful. It's so ornate. The mould has been lined with paper that is smeared with butter and stuck to the butter are the vegetables cut into shapes. The next stage is to fill the mould with pureed potato. We've got to put a couple of egg yolks into there. And this will um, help to stiffen it up, won't it? Yeah, it when will it's sit. cooked, It'll set, exactly. Yeah. And it's nicely seasoned with pepper and salt and it should be quite thick. There we go. Right. Now, this is the difficult bit because you have got to get all of that puree in there without disturbing them. Slip it down. So Slip the, it the, down. The best way is to slide a little bit in at a time. This dish was a hot entree served after three or four courses of what was frequently a nine course menu. These were the fanciest savoury dishes that mm -hmm. the chef could muster up. They'd eaten a lot of food already, and these were just to whet your appetite, really. Um, you saw all these beautiful patterns and colours, and you felt hungry again. Mm -hmm. Right, Rosemary, well, I think that's ready. I'm going to put this on to poach for about 40 minutes. OK. Back upstairs, the local dignitaries would have gathered here, in the most impressive room in the house, to meet the 13-year-old princess. It's the red drawing room. And this is who Victoria was calling upon. Lady Litchfield, together with her boy Thomas, and the most adorable-looking little child there in the foreground, who's Harriet, whom Victoria actually played with during her visit here. Now, you could say that some artists tend to flatter their subjects, but this artist, George Hayter, I don't think did, because Louise was always thought to be a bit of a cracker, and indeed, even Queen Victoria noted that Louisa was alluring and invariably incredibly kind. The Earl and Lady Louisa were on friendly terms with Victoria's mother, the Litchfield family had been attached to the royal court since the days of William IV and relished the idea of the Duchess and her precious daughter coming to stay. This was a bit of a hastily arranged visit by the Duchess. It started with an exchange of letters two months earlier and brilliantly for us, we have copies of those very letters. And indeed, the Duchess, a couple of months before the visit, was writing as yet, I have no fixed time for leaving this part of the country, but if it be in our power, and you should be at Shugborough, we shall be happy to visit you. The Litchfields were delighted. In fact, they pushed their luck a bit and asked the royal party to stay for an additional day, to wit, the Duchess agreed. Now, that was something of a coup. 
It was in this very room that Victoria and her mother received the great and the good of the area. Seven carriage loads turned up to meet them, including the mayor and the clergy, and the whole thing was covered by the local press. The Staffordshire Advertiser proudly reported the scene, quoting Victoria's mother's gracious response to the mayor's address. It was rather telling. The princess will derive the greatest benefit from these journeys. They bring her in contact with all classes. They are the means of allowing her to know all the varied interests of this great and free country. The advertiser's man on the spot gave his own observations of the princess. He wrote, The princess is a most interesting young person, and her simple dress, simple almost to plainness, accords well with the prepossessing features of an amiable, mild and intelligent cast. Given the limited access the public had to their future queen, such tidbits about Victoria would have been of huge interest to ordinary folk. Downstairs, I'm cooking a dish with Ivan that would have very likely graced the table during Victoria's visit, fillets of pheasant a la chartreuse. And the next stage is to puree some cooked chestnuts in a very Victorian fashion. The first thing we use is something called a potato beetle. Right, I've never seen one of those. Which we just pound the chestnuts with. Yes. So you have a go at it. Yes. Now you're going to turn those into a pulp. And while you're doing that, I've already got some here, and I rub it through the sieve with this gizmo here, which... What a wonderful thing! So it pushes it right through the mesh. I have to tell you, I put my potato through one of these drum sieves. Absolutely. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Do you use one of these? No, I want one. Can yeah. I take that home with me? No way. <laughs> Took me two years to find one. <laughs> Right, that's great. Would you like to pour that, some of that into there? Yes. That's great. And I'll start pushing that through. I'll tell you what, let's change over. You have a go at this. I'd love to. And I will try and get this into shape. And these jobs really were great for two kitchen maids. Oh, yes. They could have a little natter while they did it, discuss okay. the local gossip. But no gossiping during the next stage of our fashionable 1830s dish. My reputation for wielding a filleting knife has earned me the task of dealing with a pheasant. Yes, you are good with a knife. That's right, so take off the legs. I'm just going to remove the wishbone because that'll allow me to get the whole breast off. It's very, I'm just very interested to see how the modern technique is actually identical to the way in which a Victorian really? cook would have done. Absolutely, yeah. This is very specialised. We even have to trim them in a particular way. That's great. At an angle. At, uh, at an angle towards the meat, that's towards it. You. Yeah, that's perfect. Now, these little bits that are left over, I'm, I'll probably use them for something else a little bit later on. They won't get wasted. So while the chateau's poaches away, the pheasant is fried off, ready for the next stage of our dish. Since becoming heir to the throne at the tender age of 11, the princess was kept under 24-hour surveillance by her mother, the Duchess of Kent. Such was her paranoia that something untoward might happen to her. The sleeping arrangements while at Shugborough backed this up. Victoria slept in this bedroom with her mother, most likely in the same bed, just like she did back at Kensington Palace. On the second day of Victoria's visit to Shugborough, the party went from Litchfield the home to Litchfield the place, where more of the people could see their future queen. Victoria records in her diary, at 10 we set out for Litchfield, the whole party going, children and all. Lord and Lady Litchfield went in our open carriage. We proceeded to the cathedral, which is quite beautiful. The figures worked in stone on the outside, and the three beautiful spires are worthy of great admiration. We went into the interior of the cathedral, into a pew. And the choristers sang an anthem. at the house, the poor maids had no time for sightseeing. With the royal party in residence, there would have been even more work to do than usual. At the laundry, the work was back-breaking. The maids would fill a laundry copper, which heated the water. This meant carrying hundreds of back-breaking buckets in from the yard. 
Shapra House still boasts a 19th century laundry and it's now used to demonstrate how the work was done back then. So how much extra work would there have been because of the royal visit? Oh, it would have been double or treble. We'd have needed extra help coming in from the uh, village because of all the uh, bed linen and then extra tablecloths, they'd need napkins, make an awful lot of washing. What sort of hours did they work? Uh, they worked 12 hour days starting at 5 a.m. in the morning, working six and a half days a week. Only half a day, a day on off. Sunday to go to church and one day off a month. That is not much, is it? Not a lot. So was there a weekly routine here for the maids? The main washing would be through from Monday till Tuesday, and then from Wednesday to Friday, it would be the ironing, the folding and the airing. Then Saturday and Sunday, we're sorting all the dirty washing and then start all over again. A 12-hour day was pretty demanding for the servants, and the work would have been more daunting had Shagbar not invested in some of the latest gizmos and gadgets to help ease the laundry maid's pain. When Victoria was here, this was the latest piece of equipment. It's called a dolly peg, and it's just twist and turn like this, backwards and forwards. We say a hundred turns for each load of washing. A hundred turns? A hundred turns. But the dolly peg was luxury on legs compared to the old washboard, as I'm about to find out. You need to rub the cloth up yes. and down on the wooden slats using your knuckles. Knuckles? Imagine doing this all day long. <laughs> I think you'll make an excellent maid. Oh, it's coming off too! <laughs> it's brilliant, it's working! Just as I've mastered Victorian washing, there's still the ironing to do. And believe it or not, this is what they would have used for all the extra laundry. What is this contraption? It looks like something out of a torture chamber. I know it does. It's called a box mangle and it's an ironing machine. We use it to iron all the large flat items like sheets and tablecloths that would take a very long time with a, with a hot iron. The many tablecloths required for Victoria's visit would have been wound around these two rollers which were placed under the weighted box. Go the other way. So how many people would have manned this? Ideally you need three people. The handyman to operate the machine and two maids putting the cloth on and off the rollers. I think you can stop now, Rosemary. <laughs> oh, thank goodness for modern irons. When Victoria visited, Shugborough was practically a self-sufficient estate. It had a farm and a flour mill. And it had something else, something appreciated by the toffs and the servants alike, its very own brew house, built in 1780 and restored to full working glory in the 1990s. Wow, what a great space this is, the original brew house. Nick Burton and Keith Bott are in charge today. At the time of Victoria's visit, the brewers produced up to 40,000 gallons of beer a year. 320,000 pints a year. Who's drinking all this beer? Ness? Well, the servants during the time of Victoria's visit have about eight pints a day. Although some of them have one over the eight. Is that where the expression comes that's from? That's where it comes oh, from. That's yes. brilliant, isn't it? Yes. But this isn't strong stuff, is it? No, it's called small beer. It's only about one or two percent proof. It's sort of a combination of an alka pop and an energy drink of the day. There was another good reason to drink beer during the time of Victoria's visit. Cholera was spreading across Britain, killing thousands, and thus the fermented and purified bevy was a safer option than water. So did his lordship also go for the safer option and down a pint with his supper? Was it normal for aristocratic families to consume beer like this, or was it something peculiar to Shagborough? Oh, absolutely, in a lot of the houses. Um, but yes, it, the water wasn't good for them, you necessarily. You didn't know what it was, so yes, people did have beer. His lordship can, of course, afford wine and has wine with the meals, but he also is a general drink, and for his parties and his hunting parties and things, yes, he has beer. Yeah. What do we know about beer consumption during Victoria's visit? Well, we know from the records that around 450 gallons of beer was consumed over a, a three-day visit. Visit. But of course, if you start to remember that there was 109 members of, of staff at Shugborough at that time mm -hmm. who were all having a gallon a day, then the actual amount consumed by the visitors was somewhat less, uh, but still around 150 odd gallons of beer. 150 gallons? I mean, they were only here for a few days. That's 1,200 pints. They certainly enjoyed their beer then. Funny to picture the Duchess of Kent downing a pint, but if she did, it would have been a lighter lady's beer because it was brewed in different strengths. The strongest for the lords, less strong for the ladies. Cheers. Cheers, cheers. cheers. Very good luck. 
and they still brew it today. Well, it's a fair drop, that, isn't it? Beautiful. It's not bad at all. Back in the kitchen, our pheasant has been fried, and it's time to see if our chartreuse, which has been poaching for 40 minutes, has worked. The big moment has arrived because we've actually got to demold this monster here. Now, the way we're going to do that is with a great deal of care. And then I do a, a Tommy Cooper job. And then we pray. OK. Because this is very, very difficult. Easy does it. <laughs> Just look at that. And it's the butter in the mould that enables us to get that off. That is beautiful. <gasps> Steam coming off it. Now, it's named after the Carthusian monks, whose monasteries are known as charter houses in France, that's Chartres. Mm -hmm. And they were meant to be vegetarians, um, but they often weren't. And usually a chartreuse is a shell, a beautiful mosaic yeah. of vegetables on the outside, mm. but often hidden inside are pigeons and sausages and things. Mm. And it's a satire, really, on the fact that these monks broke their vegetarian vows because the meat's all hidden inside. I never knew that. <laughs> Fascinating. Time to delve into our chestnut puree. You just taste that now. It should be delicious. It's nicely seasoned. It's been cooked in the pheasant mm. stock. Absolutely delicious. Yeah. I'm now going to fill the centre. Yes. And I'm going to very carefully build it up into the shape of a turban. Oh. oh. It was a very, very common and popular form of presenting an entree. Lovely though this recipe is, to our modern eyes, I think it looks rather peculiar. But much like today, the fruit reflects society. The Victorians were, after all, engineers and builders, and their food was heavily engineered too. There's just one more thing left to do before we serve it to Lord Wanacott upstairs. Thanks. Victoria's host, Lord Litchfield, was a very jolly fellow by all accounts, but he was also described by contemporaries as an extravagant and imprudent man. A bit of a waster, then. Hosting the princess and her mother cost a fair bit, but a gambling habit cost him far more. In fact, ten years after Victoria's visit, it cost him almost the entire estate. And he created his very own gaming room for his addiction. Oh, hello. I bet the very young Victoria saw this building, but I bet nobody told her what went on in here. This is Shugborough's Tower of the Winds. This pretty little tower was the Earl's personal gambling den, and he lost a large proportion of his fortune upstairs. Most of the gambling that went on here was cards. But it would have been the GGs that did the Earl in. That and general overexpenditure and speculation. <laughs> But in 1841, the Earl's lawyer, who was a bit of a bookie on the quiet, brought an action against him for £20,000, a stupendous amount of money, for the recovery of racing and gambling debts. To pay off his debts, Litchfield had to sell the contents of Shugborough. He hung on to the family silver and some portraits, but everything else had to go. He made almost a million pounds in today's money, but the shame of it all sent him abroad. So, just ten years after Victoria's visit, the place was mothballed and became silent. A small part of it was occupied by a gardener and his family, and the Earl headed off in his coach for a quieter and more economical life in France. On the last night of her visit, the Princess and the Duchess enjoyed a dinner and then a ball, where the young Victoria, dressed in pink satin, danced under the watchful gaze of her mother. She wrote in her diary, 
At seven, we dined, and after dinner, we danced. I danced three quadrille, first with Lord Anson, then with Lord Paget, and then with Lord Russell. And we are to be served our fabulous pheasant dish as she would have been in the very same dining room. Served? We're going to be served. Gentlemen! What's a turner? I fancy we've got the butler and the underbutler. We certainly have today. Oh, lovely. And what are they bringing us, Rosemary? This is fillet of pheasant a la chatreuse. I tell you what really grabs me first off... What does? ..is the way these little baby vegetables have been so artistically oh. arranged. Marvellous, isn't it? You have to have the patience of a saint. You need the patience of a saint and the income of a lord. You certainly do. All the lot of chat about this, Rosemary. I'd like to try a bit, if I could. Now, this is going to be interesting because there's definitely a process here. Mm -hmm. The butler takes it and gives it to the under-butler. I'm learning something here. Yep. Then the butler does the actual portion control. And his lordship gets his two slabs. That's look jolly good, I have to say. Everything's in season. Oh, that, that, oh. Ooh. The chestnut is in the... In the juices, I say they did live well, you know. As it's so incredibly romantic in this dining room, what with the candle lit and everything, I've got a little treasure for you to have a look at. What is this? Uh -huh. It's a little brooch for the youngest of the Litchfield children. That we've seen earlier yes. in a portrait. So she'd have been about four and Victoria was 13. And they played together. And when she left, Victoria presented Harriet with the emerald and diamond brooch. How lovely mm. is that? Now, I've had quite a beery day. I've been off to the brew house. Oh, how lovely. And that's why we've got this. This is his lordship's own, which is the strong ale produced out of the Shugborough Brewery. Right. And you've got a bit of milady's fancy there, which is not quite so strong. Oh, well, let's do a swap. What? Well, let's do a swap. <laughs> I'll have the strong one. Well, have All a little right. cheers to my on this. To my lords and my ladies. And just see how this goes down the hatch. See, it's quite floral, isn't it? It's very strong. And that's the strong one, isn't it? Yes. Mm. Now, there's another beer connection in this room, because if you look up at that stucco on the ceiling, that 3D effect in the 18th century was supposed to have come about partly because they used beer in the plaster mix so that it stuck better. Really? Not that, necessarily Shugborough beer. Is, is that where they got the saying, you're plastered? <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be. Victoria and her mother left early the next morning as her progress around the country continued. This punishing schedule took its toll on the young princess, but her mother was determined to keep her profile as high as possible. Join us next time on Royal Upstairs Downstairs at Harwood House, where three years later she was still on the road, being paraded around the country to meet the great and the good.